John chapter 4 and verse 43. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. Then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then he inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. In the four gospels, there are 37 named miracles that are recorded. We know from several statements in the gospels that Jesus actually performed hundreds, if not literally thousands of other miracles that are not recorded. Of the four Gospels, Matthew records the most, 27 miracles. John records the least. Depending on who is counting, John only names seven or eight miracles that Jesus performed. John's one of his first disciples, so John has been with him for the entire earthly ministry of Christ. And so John could have, when he wrote his Gospel, he could have told a hundred stories. But for some reason, he only told seven or eight, depending on who's counting. And he includes only stories for a specific purpose. You may remember that in John 20, John gives his thesis statement, his purpose statements at the very end of his gospel. And John says many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So John tells stories that he believes will demonstrate that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that would encourage people to believe on him. He calls these miracles signs. These are like signposts that point to Christ. The first miracle that Jesus performed is in John 2. It is turning the water into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. Now Jesus has come full circle. He is back in Cana of Galilee. And now he performs the second miracle that we have just read. Now verse 54, the last of the chapter tells us, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. Of course, John is not counting the miracles that Jesus performed the first time when he went to Jerusalem and, 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 and cleansed the temple. And, and the Bible says he did many miracles there. So he's not referencing those miracles. He is referencing only miracles that he considers to be sign miracles. Jesus has left Judea. He has come through Samaria and he's returned in the Galilee. Gospel harmonies will tell us that when he comes into Galilee, this is the beginning of what is called his Galilean ministry. That Galilean ministry is 18 to 21 months long. We'll just say 18 months long. And you can divide the ministry of Christ into several periods. I'm sure Brother Squires has covered this in Life of Christ. But you have the early Judean ministry that takes place at the very beginning. It's 8 to 12 months. It is found only in the Gospel of John. From John 1 and verse 19 
to John 4 and verse 41. That's his early Judean ministry. All of that is found only in the Gospel of John. Now we are in Galilee. This is the larger Galilean ministry, 18 to 21 months long. Then there will be the later Judean ministry, three months. There will be the Perean ministry, three months. And then you have the Passion Week, which is the week leading up to his death and resurrection. Matthew, Mark, and Luke skip entirely over the first year of the Lord's ministry. And they have him beginning his ministry after the baptism and the temptation. They have him beginning his ministry in Galilee, which is where we are right now. This Galilee ministry is going to be 18 months long. It is the longest division of his ministry in Israel. During this time, he will travel down to Jerusalem once for a feast. But his time in Galilee is divided into three preaching tours around the Sea of Galilee. And during this time, he will perform literally hundreds of miracles around Capernaum and all of the surrounding places. Just as a bookmark, look at chapter 4 and verse 43. After two days, he departed thence, leaving Samaria, and went into Galilee. Now look at chapter 5 and verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So here it is. Jesus is in Judea, leaves Judea, comes to Samaria, spends two days there, comes into Galilee. John tells you about one thing that happens and in the very next chapter has him back down in Jerusalem for the feast. Now, between John 4 and John 5, in that little space between those two chapters, you have Jesus being rejected at Nazareth. You have him moving to Capernaum. He calls four, fisher, or four brothers to become fishers of men. He heals a demon-possessed son on the Sabbath. He heals Peter's mother-in-law. He heals a leper. He heals a paralytic. He calls Matthew, the tax collector, to be his disciple. And John says nothing about that. Now, look at chapter 5 and verse 1 again. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Look at chapter 6 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. So all of chapter 5 has Jesus in Jerusalem. Now in chapter 6, he's back in Galilee. The Galilean ministry now continues with that brief excursion to Jerusalem. This second half of his ministry in Galilee has Jesus healing a man with a withered hand, calling the rest of his disciples, he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, heals the centurion's servant, raises a widow's son from the dead, calms the sea, casts the demon out of the maniac of Gadara, <coughs> raises Jairus' daughter from the dead, heals the woman with the issue of blood, gives sight to two blind men, none of which John mentions. He says nothing about that. Now, I could keep going, but, but I, I think that you get the picture. John brings him into Galilee, where there's going to be this year and a half ministry. And in that entire year and a half ministry, John tells you only three things that happened. Only three miracles. <clears throat> he tells you about healing the nobleman's son. He's going to tell you in chapter 6 about feeding of the 5,000. And then he's going to tell you about walking on the water. John is very selective. The reason why is the other three Gospels have been circulating in the churches for years by now. And John doesn't want to just rewrite their Gospels. That's part of what makes the Gospel of John very unique. He's telling you stories that only meet a specific purpose. Come back to John 4, look at verse 45. <clears throat> then when he was coming to Galilee, the Galileans received him having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. Now, I don't believe that that is a specific day. I believe that what he's talking about is the general attitude of the Galileans that they had toward Christ. However, some commentators think there's a contradiction because look at the verse before it, verse 44. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. 
So how do you have a verse of rejection in verse 44, but a verse of acceptance or reception in verse 45? There has been no rejection of Christ yet in John's gospel. But Jesus knew that he would not be received as the Son of God in his own region. John doesn't record this, but the very first attempt on his life would be in his own hometown of Nazareth. However, the Galileans did receive him, but they received him only as a miracle worker. And that is very important to understanding this story. See, verse 45 tells us that some Galileans had been in Jerusalem at the Feast of Passover when Jesus was there in chapter number two. And they had witnessed Jesus doing miracles in Jerusalem. Now he is back in Galilee. It is rumored that Jesus is in the region. And they're coming to him on that basis alone, hoping to see him perform another miracle. But just like in Jerusalem, Jesus knew that they were shallow followers with superficial faith. In fact, if you fast forward to the next miracle in Galilee that John mentions, it is John 6, the feeding of the 5,000. What a great miracle. Did you know that the end of chapter 6 says that from that time, many of his disciples turned back and walked no more with him. That is shallow, superficial faith that says that we will follow as long as there is a miracle. And John is setting that up. I believe that's the reason why John skips over a hundred stories and he picks out just this one and he tells this one because this miracle is going to demonstrate the faith of a man that goes beyond a shallow belief. Here is a man who is going to demonstrate the kind of faith that is required to follow Christ. Remember what John wrote. He said, these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God. And there's an emphasis on believing. Look at this in verse number 48. <clears throat> verse, verse number 48. Then said Jesus unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Look at verse 50. Jesus saith unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth, and the man believed. Look at verse number 53. So the father knew that it was the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. So, so here, here it is. The story is about belief. The story is about a man having faith in the midst of a people with shallow, superficial faith. And I want to preach to you just for a little bit on the faith of a nobleman. And, and, and I believe that in this story, there, there is a progression of faith that I want you to see. And the first one is I want you to see desperate faith. Look at verse 46. <clears throat> so Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. There was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Thank you. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, when the Bible says that he is a nobleman, that most likely means that he was an official in the king's court. That's probably what that means. The king over Israel in that day was Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was a very wicked man. The Jews hated him because he was an Edomite. And uh, that means he's a half Jew. He's not a full-blooded Jew. He's not Jewish. And, and, and they hated that a non-Jew would be ruling over them. He is a vassal king to Rome. He only has enough power to pretty much do what he wants to as long as he keeps peace in the region and keeps the taxes flowing to Rome. He is a petty tyrant. This is the Herod that had John the Baptist beheaded because John the Baptist said you shouldn't marry your brother's wife. And he had his head chopped off for that. And Herod, Herod was scared of John and he's scared of Jesus because when he heard about Jesus performing miracles, he was afraid that was John the Baptist come back from the dead. It's interesting that in the entire ministry of the Lord, there is one town in Galilee that he never went to. It was Tiberias. And Tiberias was the hometown 
of Herod Antipas. So here is a nobleman that is connected somehow to the palace of Herod. He lives in Capernaum and he has a son who is deathly ill. He has heard the reports that Jesus has the power to heal and he is desperate for help. He is, by the way, at the exact same place that Nicodemus was in chapter 3. No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. For you to be able to do the miracles I'm hearing about, there has to be something supernatural about you. He doesn't believe anything else at this point. And he's desperate to believe what he does believe. He's in a tight spot, if you please. So he comes to Canaan, which is about 20 miles from Capernaum, and he comes on a wing and a prayer. And, and, and I don't know at what point in the Galilean ministry, is it at the beginning, is it at the ending, is it in the middle, I, I don't know. I know that Capernaum, his hometown, would see more miracles than any other city in all of Galilee. But I don't know how many of those miracles he has seen at this point. But he does believe that Jesus can do a miracle, and he is desperate, he is desperate for a miracle for his son. Now I want you to know that's not saving faith, but it is a starting point. Faith doesn't start out full and, and strong. Sometimes faith is weak and it is limited in infant stages. This man implores Jesus to come to Capernaum. Here's what he says, ere my child die. So it tells me two things. It tells me that he believes Jesus is going to have to be present for the miracle. You're going to have to come to Capernaum. And then somehow he has not considered that Jesus could do anything if his son were to die. There is no record of Jesus raising anybody from the dead yet. So he believes that Jesus needs to come, be present to perform the miracle. And if he dies, then it's too late. So, so you can see his faith is very small. It is very limited, it is very weak, and it is in a state of desperation. And do you know that there are a lot of people who have come to Jesus in desperate times with weak faith? And Jesus doesn't always perform a miracle because he knows that such faith is superficial. But what he will do is he will test that faith to see if it will go any farther. Sometimes God will use a crisis to draw a man to himself to see if he will have faith in him. Whether it is a financial collapse, whether it is family trouble, whether it is a terminal illness, whether it is a broken family, whatever it is might be, sometimes it is only in desperate times that a man will come to Christ. This nobleman had plenty of evidence before him that Jesus is the Messiah. But he never goes and hears Jesus preach because he doesn't feel that he needs him. He's a nobleman in Herod's court. How is he going to go and entertain somebody who claims to be the next king of the Jews? How's that going to work while you're working for Herod, huh? He, 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 life is too good and life is too busy. He has too much to lose and nothing to gain to consider Jesus. The stories are interesting. Maybe he believes them, maybe he does not, but not enough to investigate the claims. But then his son gets sick. And desperate times are the messengers of God that says, come to me. There are folks tonight, this morning, all over Santa Rosa County that wouldn't give God or church five minutes of their time. They have no use for the church. They have no use for God. They have no use for religion, but desperate times hit. They haven't prayed two times in their life, but when the doctor says it's canceled, they call the church asking the preacher to pray for them. And most times they ask for a miracle and they make these great promises. And when the crisis is over, they go right back to their godless lives. Desperate times as God say, come to me. In fact, maybe, maybe, maybe you've done that yourself. And by the way, not all crisis faith is shallow faith. But if that is the first time you exercise faith, then it most likely is. 
We, 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 all, we all know people who, who, who go through desperate times and they're trusting God for either a miracle or for grace to make it through this burden. But they have a history, they have a lifetime of trusting God behind them. This is not the first time they've prayed. It's not the first time they've called out to God. It's not the first time that they've had to depend on him. They had faith in God before the crisis came and now they have faith in God to carry them through that crisis. But others have no faith. They have no faith until there is an emergency and the first time that they pray, they are desperate for a miracle. And they promise God the moon. If you'll dig me out of bankruptcy or if you'll put this marriage back together. And I would just say this morning that if you, that's you, don't expect a miracle, expect a test. That's what Jesus is going to do. We're going to test this man to see, to see how far your faith will go. You believe that I can heal your son? All right, I'm going to test you to see if your crisis faith will take you another step. There is desperate faith. But then the second progression is there is deficient faith. Look at verse 48. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Now that almost sounds like a rebuke. I don't believe it's intended to. But notice Jesus doesn't answer him. Jesus doesn't give him a promise. Instead, he doesn't indicate, I will or I will not go to Capernaum to hear your son. He doesn't say anything about that. But he makes a general statement that is true of all of Israel. Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. And I think about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 22. Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. That's the nature of the Jews, is that they require a sign. It was an indictment against Capernaum. That though Capernaum had been privileged to see all of these miracles, they still would not believe. And Jesus said, Jesus said, thou Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, you'll be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, they would have repented and believed. But not you. So you have deficient faith. And you know there's a lot of people that operate on that base level. Show me a sign and I'll believe. Show me a miracle and I'll have faith. I believe the charismatic people, have, charismatic crowd has done a great disservice and great harm to, to a lot of people because they place such a huge emphasis on, on miracles, receiving a miracle and seeing some supernatural thing. I've been dealing for several months with a Pentecostal fellow and having several conversations with him. And, and, and when you try to have a conversation with him about the Lord and about the Bible, he, he's got so much Pentecostalism in him that every conversation turns, turns toward a miracle that he saw. A faith healer that, that, that he knows, a, a church service where there were signs and wonders and it keeps coming. And I can't break through that. And there is no simple trust in God's word. You can't have a conversation on what does God say because the word is not as spectacular as the wonder that he wants to see. Right. And the charismatics and the religious hucksters that are on, on, on Christian TV, they have capitalized on, on the desire of religious but lost people to see something spectacular. I want to see a phenomenon instead of just believing God for the unseen. And by the way, I believe every miracle that's recorded in the Bible happened as it's recorded in the miracle. I, in the Bible, I believe that. I believe that God performs miracles. In fact, I believe that God still performs miracles today. In fact, I would even say that you may have experienced a miracle. I believe that God can suspend the supernatural that, uh, or suspend the natural laws of life and, and he can do something supernatural that there is absolutely no explanation for. And I believe that you could have experienced a miracle, but that's not the norm. It's interesting to me that if you'll study miracles in the Bible, you don't find miracles happening all over the place. There are really, I'll just give this to you. There are really three periods in Bible history when there was an influx of miracles. The ministry of Moses and Joshua, the ministry of Elijah and Elisha, the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. During those three periods is when you find 90% of the miracles in the Bible. There are some of those that are outliers, but that's when miracles happened during those three distinct periods. By the way, 
All three of those periods, none of them were over 100 years in length. So, so it's not like over thousands of years of Bible history that there's miracles just happening everywhere. And the miracles that did happen during the time of Moses and Joshua happened by the hand of Moses and Joshua. The miracles that happened during the times of Elijah and Elisha happened by the hand of Elijah and Elisha. The miracles that happened during the days of Jesus and the apostles happened by the hand of Jesus and the apostles. It's not like you had a bunch of faith healers running around everywhere doing all kinds of miracles. That, that, that's not what was happening. And you don't need a miracle, and here's the reason why. Faith that demands a miracle is deficient faith. Miracles have never produced a wholesale faith. They are intended to point to the truth, and you place your faith in the truth. Faith does not come by sight. Faith comes by hearing. And if you have the word of God in your hand, then you do not need a miracle. You hear charismatic say, God has a miracle for you today. No, he doesn't. He has a word for you today. So here comes a nobleman with desperate faith and Jesus speaks to him of deficient faith. And this man has two flaws in his weak faith. He believes that Jesus has to be present for the miracle. And he believes that if his son dies, then it's too late. And Jesus makes a general statement about Israel and about this man. And then Jesus is going to turn and give him some hope. Because if you come to Jesus, even with flawed theology, if you will hear him, he will teach you something. Right. And I think, I think of how many people there are in the world who truly believe that they believe in Christ, but the basis of their belief is some perceived miracle. How many times have we tried to witness to somebody of the gospel and they tell you that they're already saved and in the next breath they tell you about a miracle that they experienced? Some supernatural happening, some vision that they saw one night and that is the confirmation that they are saved. Several years ago, I was at West Florida Hospital and I'd gone to visit a lady who was on her deathbed and I was trying to witness to her. And, and, and every time that I would try to witness, I've tried to witness to her in earnest, but every time that I tried to preach to her, she kept assuring me that she was saved. Now, there's absolutely nothing in her life to say that she was saved. But she assured me on her deathbed that she was saved. And she kept going back to a near death experience that she had that God saved her from. And to her, that was confirmation that she was a child of God. There's Catholics that, that travel to see some shrine or some shroud or some miracle. And they get, they get swept up emotionally in what they believe is a miracle. And that becomes their hope of salvation. But I want you to know that saving faith does not rest upon miracles. In fact, you ought to listen to your own testimony of salvation. I have had Baptists. I have had Baptists tell me their salvation experience and sprinkled in it was a vision, a feeling, a warm, fuzzy something that came over them. And when I got saved, there were no bright lights. There were no angels on the bedposts. There were no visions. There were no warm sensations. None of that. There was no outward, visible, tangible representation of anything. There, there was none of that. If I had to stand in court, somebody ought to help me. If I had to stand in court today and defend my salvation, here's what I'd bring. I'd bring my Bible. That's the only defense that I have. Somebody says, what if it's not true? Then I will die and go to hell believing that it is because I don't have anything else. I don't have a miracle. I don't have a vision. I don't have bright lights. I don't have thunder and lightnings. I don't have God saving me from a motorcycle. I don't have any of that. And if you are going to talk me out of my salvation, then you're going to have to destroy my faith in the word of God. And I say that if in the recesses of your mind you have some miracle confirmation that you're holding on to, you need to check your testimony. Amen. In fact, my faith is not even in my profession of faith. I prayed, but my, my, my assurance is not in my prayer. 
Because I don't remember everything I prayed. Did I pray the right words? Did I pray them in the right order? Did I have the right attitude? Was I sincere? Was I, huh? Did I know what I was doing? Did I not know what I was doing? Huh? Well, I'm sure if there is an exact way to pray, I didn't hit it that night. So my, my, my assurance is not in my prayer. By the way, it doesn't matter because I'm not going to heaven on my prayer. I prayed and you did too, but it is not the prayer that I prayed that is a magical key that unlocks the kingdom of God for me. It is my faith toward God and my repentance of sin. That's all that I brought to the table. And the faith was the faith of a child. It wasn't much. I didn't ask for a miracle. I wasn't looking for a miracle. The word of God was so strong in my heart that I didn't need signs and wonders. And lo and behold, he performed a miracle that night in my heart. When all that you have is God's word and that is enough, then you can exercise saving faith. There's desperate faith. There's deficient faith. But then there is deepening faith. Look at verse 49. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Now there are two miracles that happen in these verses, and if you're not careful, you'll miss the greater one. The first miracle is that Jesus tells the nobleman to return home and find that your son has been healed. Later, this man meets his servants halfway home and they tell him, your, your son has been healed. They compare notes and they find out that about the same time that Jesus said it, it is the same time that the fever left his body. So Jesus heals a boy from 20 miles away without ever meeting the boy, without ever knowing what his symptoms are. It's a great miracle. Not the greatest miracle. The greater miracle is what takes place in the heart of the nobleman. The Bible says in verse 50, 50 the last part, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. He believed in the power of Jesus to perform miracles enough to come to Cana to seek his help. <laughs> he believed in his word enough to go home trusting that his son has been healed. He believed that Jesus was a miracle worker, but he also believed that Jesus was a truth teller. He believed in his power, but now he believes in his word. Can I tell you that miracles have no saving power? God could do a stupendous miracle for you. God could raise you out of, a, out of a, the deathbed. God could do a wonderful miracle for you physically, and it would not do a thing for your salvation. Because the works have no saving power, only His Word has saving power. He has enough faith to come to Jesus in desperate faith. In verse 50, he believes his word enough to go home, trusting that his prayer has been answered. But look at verse 50 again. The man believed, hang on to that word, believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him and went his way. Look at verse 53. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed. And well, what's this belief? Verse 50 already says he believes. Now verse 53 says he believes again. Does he believe something more than what's indicated in verse number 50? And notice how emphatic it is in verse 53. And himself believed and his household. He believed in his power. He believed in the words when he spoke to him. But when he got home and saw his son living, I believe his steps, faith went a step further. He believed in Christ himself. Surely he has heard the rumors that this man could be the Messiah. And now that he has seen what he's seen, he says, surely he must be the Messiah. Somewhere along the way, the blanks are filled in. And this man becomes a believer in Christ himself. You can believe in the power of Christ, but that's not enough. 
You can read the Bible and have mental consent. That's not enough. What do you believe about him? And remember, remember, this is a sign miracle. Seven that John includes. Why does he write it? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing he might have life through his name. Well, this would not be a sign of that if this man does not believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And I believe that he does believe that. What started out as a crisis faith has turned into a faith so strong, it spreads to his household, and his whole house believes. Now that doesn't mean that anybody got saved because he was saved. Every man comes to Jesus by himself. But your faith can be a strong witness to your family. And you can see your family, your household come to Christ because of the witness of your faith. And there's so many that would say he's a great man, he's a great teacher, he's a great rabbi, but he's not the son of God. And you can be wrong on a lot of things, but there's no wiggle room on that. Because if you don't believe him, then you are damned. If you have faith in him, then faith in his power and faith in his word are comprehended in that. I believe in Jesus Christ, therefore I believe in his power. And I believe in his word. And when you believe in his power, it brings you safety. But when you have faith in his word, that brings assurance. Faith in his person brings satisfaction. When he believed in his power enough to come ask him for a miracle, I believe that is when he was assured that his son would be healed. When he believed the word of Jesus enough to return home without the Lord coming to him, that's believed when he received the assurance in his heart that it would be done. But when he believed in his heart, Jesus Christ himself, it was influential to spread to his entire household. Faith of a nobleman. Now I'll show you one more thing in this story that I find very interesting. And it is, it's in there just as a coincidence, if you believe in coincidences. And I don't. Look if you would in verse 52. I'm almost done. Back up to verse 51. As he was going down, his servants coming to him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. It is 20 miles from Capernaum to Cana. The average person, the average walking gate, you can walk about a mile every 20 minutes. 20 minute mile, just walking. It's a three to four hour journey, walk, to get to Capernaum. All right? This is considering that maybe he doesn't have a chariot, he's got to walk. He's a nobleman, so he probably. So, so we're talking three, four hours to get there. We know from the verse that the miracle took place at the seventh hour, Jewish time, that is one o'clock in the afternoon. So if this man met Jesus at one o'clock and he has his miracle, he can be home before dinner. Nightfall for sure. But for some reason, he doesn't leave until the next day. Because when the servants told him about the miracle, they said it happened yesterday, about the seventh hour. Now, everything beyond this, guys, is speculation. You understand this? <laughs> everything beyond this is pure speculation. You can speculate when you say this is speculation. <laughs> there is no way of knowing what happened. I would have went home immediately. I think I would have. I mean, I think I would have hurried back home to see what happened. But he doesn't do that. I don't know why. Maybe the wheel fell off of his chariot. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. But for some reason, he stays in Cana with Jesus for a full day before going back home. Speculation. Maybe he stayed to hear Jesus teach. Maybe he stayed, to, I, I don't know, spec, speculation. I just know that he had enough faith 
in his word that he didn't have to go home and see the miracle to have it confirmed. And for some reason, he delays his return to a terminally ill son and decides to stay one day in the same place where Jesus was. He was a nobleman in Herod's court, but he is now a nobleman in God's kingdom. John saw hundreds of miracles. And while he was writing his gospel, he said, I need one that demonstrates faith. I need a miracle that shows what it is like to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you have life through his name. And John remembers this nobleman, all three gospel, other gospel writers, never mention him. But John remembers him. And John says, that's the kind of faith I want men to see. And I ask you this morning, where is your faith level at? Do you have crisis faith only? You come to Jesus only when you need a miracle. You can be saved, but no communion with Christ, no prayer, no Bible. But when you get bad news, there you go running for another miracle. That's a very shallow relationship. You can be saved and have no communion with Christ outside of when you need something. And there could be some of you here this morning that you say, show me a sign and I'll believe. You have watched and listened so much faith healers and charismatic mumbo jumbo that you believe that that is what is to be expected. And if your salvation testimony includes anything miraculous, any signs and wonders, any vision, any angel sitting at the head of the bed, any thunders and lightnings, you need to check your testimony. In fact, I would tell you that Peter, Peter was one of the three disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. I would remember that. That's a miracle. But years later when Peter was writing his, his epistle in 2 Peter, he said we have a more sure word of prophecy. He references transfiguration. It says we have a more sure word of prophecy. Well, what could be more sure than seeing the Mount of Transfiguration? He said the more sure word is the word of God. You don't need a miracle when you have a word. In fact, the word that you have is the greatest miracle on earth. Can you trust just his word? And do you have faith in him? Him alone. Yes, sir. I love what the songwriter said. My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the ever living one. His wound for me shall plead. He said, I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Did you bow your heads with me this morning?